Okay, it's on. Good evening, everybody. I, I wonder if I can ask you to all sort of come into the room and find a seat and sit yourselves down. I, I spot some seats over here in this very august table on, on my right. It's very much my pleasure to welcome you all here. My name is John Woolard. I'm welcoming you here on behalf of First Mennonite Church of Edmonton, and um, we're very glad to see a turnout like this. Thank you very much for coming out for this very special evening. This is um, the last but one event in a series under the heading of Two Friends, Two Faiths. And we're very privileged to have with us um, Dr. Mohammed Ali uh, Shamali from Iran, from Kohl University there. And, um, well, we should have been having Harry Hugo, but he was sick, and so he sent along a look-alike, his son, who, <laughs> uh, uh, Chris Hugo, and he's standing in for his dad, and of course, genetics works really wonders. He'll know exactly everything his father was going to say, and uh, that will work really nicely. Um, a few other things of, of housekeeping. Um, the washrooms are through the door at the back there, small single door. Um, Bradley is pointing the way to them. I don't really need to, we can go now if you need it. Um, there's washrooms there, and if there's a long queue or a lineup, there are more washrooms downstairs, um, and you'll get to the exercise that you need to go down the stairs and then up again. In the event that there is an emergency, we have to leave. There are very obvious exit signs the way you came in. And also on this side, push through those two doors and then turn to the left and out. You're in the, in the field, it will be cold, but at least you'll be safe. So uh, that's, that's the way out there. You're, you're sitting at tables, there are already refreshments there. And please feel free to help yourselves. I'm sure you probably already are, but if you felt somehow or other that it wasn't quite proper, well, now it is proper. Please, please help yourselves. Um, there's coffee, carafes there, water, and if you need a tea, various sorts, it's available at the, um, the kitchen there that says fair trade. You don't have to trade for it, just go and fetch it, that's okay. If something runs out at the table, um, why not try and just select one person to go and get a refill or fill up the coffee carafe or fill up the water or something like that instead of seven people all going in a queue all just for the same table. It's kind of a bit, um, a bit congested. Now an important uh, matter, um, can you please all take out your cell phones? and then turn them off. <laughs> Just, and, and, unless, of course, you're waiting an urgent message from a special somebody to say that the, um, the baby boy has just arrived or something like that. <laughs> but I guess we can still leave it on in that case. But uh, it, it saves um, those very irritating interruptions that happen so often. That nobody owns up to it initially, so it keeps going and going. Um, I think that's all the practical things I need to say. Anything else? Um, I think that's it for the practical things. And so I'm um, happy to introduce now Reverend Jim Schantz, who is um, representative of Mennonite Central Committee. He represents Mennonite Central Committee on the um, advisory board for North Edmonton Ministries. He is, represents um, the Indigenous Neighbours Co-Coordinator for Mennonite.
Light Central Committee, and he also is a coordinator for the N2W2 Prison Ministry uh, Program of the Light Central Committee. So, so it's one person, he wears three hats, and so he will introduce more specially our guests. Good evening, and thank you, John, for the introduction. Um, I think we're in for a really good treat tonight, judging by the two or three events that I've already attended that are part of the, I think, seven or eight events that have been happening ever since Wednesday and will complete tomorrow at the Ronning Center down in Augustana in Cameron. I have been given quite a few details to cover tonight. They're important, there are introductions and recognitions to make. I hope I can cover them all. And I hope I can do it quickly enough so we can get right to what we want to be doing tonight in terms of hearing from our guests. Before we go further, though, I would like us to unite in prayer together. Um, well, this, Dr. Osami said this morning, it's good to pray, and it's good to do it together. And so I think that's what we want to do tonight. Is I want to offer a prayer that I have composed that I, I think represents the fact that we are here on, on Treaty 6 territory, which is where our original um, peoples were here 10,000 years before. Uh, we came as white Christians, but also new peoples have been coming, people of various faiths, including the Islamic faith. So I would like you to join in this prayer. You can reflect, open eyes, or bow your head as feels comfortable, just to uh, Set a toll uh, for our reading tonight. Let us pray. Creator of all that we see around us, the trees, the rivers, and the sky, God, the source of our being, Allah, the most gracious and merciful God, we gather in these hours in your holy presence. We gather in the common cause of bringing peace in troubled times in bringing understanding between people of different faiths and cultures, and in the hope of the reconciliation of all things in God. Give us minds that are open, hearts that are understanding, and a spirit of unity in our common humanity. May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. I would like to start out first of all by giving this a context. The context here is the Alberta Common Word, chaired by Donna Enns, and uh, this event, or the events of this entire week, could not have happened without Donna's presence and her, her work. So I want to recognize that off the top and say a little bit of a word about Alberta Common Word, which is the context for what we have been doing. And I'll I'll just read a, um, a link that Donna said is not too long ago about the common mission of Alberta Common Word. It is simply this. As Christians and Muslims, we strive to create spaces for gatherings where our faith communities can engage each other in order to overcome stereotypes and embrace our differences. And then I think an important paragraph that summarizes a little bit of the history. <laughs> This present initiative was launched in Edmonton to build on and deepen some profound Muslim Mennonite relationships of the past. And I re well remember that of the 60s because I grew up in Ontario and passed a church where there was a sister of one of those original service workers in Somalia. And uh, my mother was a good friend of the spouse of that person. So this is somewhat personal for me, that history. The second is a 10-year series of every two-year dialogues that have taken place between Shia Muslim scholars from Iran and Mennonite Christian scholars based in North America, Canadian Mennonite University. And these have been happening over two years. Dr. Harry Hubner and Dr. Shivali have been participating in these every two years, and it's been an ongoing initiative. And then there's been the goal in reviving those, the goal rather, in reviving those was to celebrate and strengthen those ties right in present-day Alberta 
so as to impact, impact our religious state fracture. A dialogue was initiated by the Mennonite Christian and Shia Muslim communities in Edmonton that grew later to involve Sunni relationships and culminated into an official gathering. And to give the history of this, I, I think we are part of something that's much more just than this local. This is a global initiative. This is a vision much bigger than ourselves here. I think that's what's so exciting about this. The Common World as a worldwide initiative was launched in 2007 as a letter signed by 138 leading Muslims to the leaders of the Christian churches and denomination of the entire world. It proposed, based on verses from the Holy Quran and the Holy Bible, that Islam and Christianity share the commandments of the paramount importance of loving God and loving one's neighbor. <coughs> It is an extended global handshake of interreligious goodwill, friendship, and fellowship, and consequently of world peace for the fifth anniversary of a common word between us and you. So that's just a little bit to give you some background and context for what it is that we are doing tonight. <clears throat> so with that context, I'd like to uh, uh, now recognize the sponsors of this event. and. Uh, this ministry, the North Edmonton Ministry, is a ministry of Mennonite Church, Alberta. And so we have uh, several here um, that are representing Mennonite Church, Alberta. And I'd like to just recognize you and have you stand, as I mentioned you. Vincent Friesen, right here, uh, is the Vice Moderator of Mennonite Church, Alberta. Would you stand, please? Thank you. Vice Moderator, and he is filling in for Someone that we're missing a lot, Dan Jack, who passed away not too long ago, but was the moderator and would surely have been, loved to have been at this event, I, I know he would have. Uh, Tim Wink Newfelt, who is the Area Minister for Mennonite Church, Alberta. Uh, Brenda Thiessen Weems, I'm not sure if she's here, but she has been chairing the Missions Committee of, of the Mennonite Church, Alberta. And I wanted to recognize her as uh, behind this effort, this uh, outreach effort. And um, also had, has been mentioned the role of the advisory committee chaired by Robert, uh, Robert Crowsford. Robert, I'd like you to stand as well. <laughs> Robert has been meticulous and thorough in getting this event planned. And uh, I, I really appreciate uh, your attention to the details in, in getting this going, Robert. Now a few uh, recognitions. Uh, I would like to recognize um, Irma, Irma Fastwick. Irma, you're over here, aren't you? What? Stand up. <laughs> University, uh, University, and is professor of practical theology there. Um, and also I would like to introduce Pastor Ingrid Dorshall, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church. Are you here, Ingrid? participated in the Reformation Sunday service this morning, and, and what a service. <laughs> I was sitting there as a Mennonite Anabaptist among these people here who were Lutherans, Catholics. They were the ones that had put us on the run 500 years ago. And here we were <laughs> sitting in this, this uh, unified uh, with, with the Imam and others. Um, uh, Burma commented, it felt like the beginning of a joke. <laughs> and I, I would have to say that you know, God has a sense of humor uh, because here we are 500 years later, we were at each other's throats, we were on the run, and here we are all together, uh, united uh, under the same roof. It, it, was, it was fantastic. I, I just loved it. I would also like to rec uh, recognize Armin Juke, editor of the Millwoods Mosaic. And he's a publicity editor for that. Thank you for being here. We've done a lot to promote the common word and some of the work that has been done. And Masood as well, a friend. Uh, he's, we've been together for at least one event in Advent last year at Donna's place. Uh, why don't you stand and just uh, say hello? Wait. <laughs> Did I get the wrong name? Masood. Masood. My apologies. Thank you. 
Uh, I'd also like to recommend, or rather recognize, uh, um, the, the uh, gifts from 10,000 Village, 10,000 Villages, the things you see here at the front, the uh, tapestries and the wall hangings that are here, and a beautiful rug right here that was given to uh, Robert uh, that we are stepping on as we climb up to the podium here. So thank you to 10,000 Villages for making these donations, and also the Fair Trade Coffee that we're drinking tonight as well. Also, I want to um, highlight a, uh, an article that Donna has published in the uh, Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary Journal called Vision. And the title is Showing the Light of Jesus in a Multi-Faith World. That's one article I want to read, and I hope we can get a hold of a number of those copies of the, of the Vision Journal of ARBS. I think that's it for the um, introductions and recognitions. I want to also mention that this is a fundraising event and there are information pieces on at the senator table that I'll refer to later uh, that give you some ideas as to how you can contribute in a very tangible way to, to this effort. He was the speaker here at First Mennonite for our first dialogue five years ago. So let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. It's now a privilege to introduce David Goa, who is the moderator of our discussion tonight, of our, of our dialogue. <clears throat> David is the founding director of the Chester Ronning Center for the Study of Religion and Public Life in cameras at the St. Augustana College. I think I can best summarize uh, from his uh, bio uh, this paragraph, because I think it fits so well what we're doing tonight. It says here, for uh, over a decade, David's work engaged many of the most demanding issues of our society, seeking to pull forward the best thinking in religious tradition and civil philosophy. He aimed to demon thinking on contentious issues and find ways for those with strongly held and competing perspectives to engage each other and find hospitable ground to nurture the common good. Thank you so much uh, for being here, David, tonight. And with that introduction, I'll have to see my clicker. Good evening. It's lovely to see all of you. Uh, I was a little bit concerned when uh, it was mentioned that if we needed to evacuate, there was a particular way of doing that because my own sense is that what is likely to happen is uh, the rapture and uh, all of us will be left except for you Mennonites. <laughs> I'm not sure what that would feel like. <laughs> Just a minute, Mike. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here with, uh, with our two colleagues. And the theme this evening is Peace Expressions in Islam and Christianity. I've asked uh, both of our colleagues if they would uh, open up the evening by speaking for about 15 minutes to the theme so that we have a bit of time together. And there are microphones there. Uh, I've never been very big on Q&A. I'm really interested in your thinking and what you make of what our colleagues have had to say and raising things that concern you. So I hope you will avail yourself of it. Uh, Chris Bubner, who I assume some of you at least uh, know, uh, has uh, did his PhD, his graduate work in theology and ethics uh, at Duke University in the Department of Religion, and also, of course, studied at the University of Manitoba, like all Mennonites have done. <laughs> and he came to the CMU to teach. He teaches in theology and uh, philosophy there. He's very interested in 
the whole ethical enterprise and the way in which ethics has been thought about from the ancient philosophical perspectives and through the Christian period in the intersection of knowledge and politics. And uh, in his book, A Precarious Peace, he examines how issues of violence and peace come to be embedded in debates about the nature of Christian theology, theories of knowledge, and questions of selfhood and identity. And I think I will introduce you too, so we have a nice flow. Dr. Muhammad Ali Shamani was born in that extraordinary city of Tehran. I uh, have long wanted to see it. He graduated from the Islamic Seminary of Qum. I first ran into Qum when I read about how the Ayatollah that ushered in the revolution in Iran had uh, been at Qum. And he also has both a BA and an MA in Western philosophy from the University of Tehran. He then went on and earned a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Manchester. And I learned today that uh, the sensible people at Manchester taught philosophy by having you read your way through from the pre-Socratics to Uncle Karl Marx. His publications, of which there are many, include a work on self-knowledge, which has been translated into another, a number of languages, on ethical relativism, and he has done work on McIntyre, Alistair McIntyre. <clears throat> He's also written a book on Shia Islam, its origins, its faith, and its practice, which I can't help but point out is translated into Spanish and Swedish. <laughs> but where is the Norwegian edition? <laughs> this is something we'll have to correct. Uh, a book on principles of jurisprudence, uh, an introduction to the methodology of fiqh. He is also the co-editor of Catholics and Shias in Dialogue, Studies in Theory and Practice, and a Catholic Shia Dialogue, Ethics in Today's Society, and also the editor of a lovely book that I have just recently read with a number of colleagues on monks and Muslims. Dr. Shamali is currently the resident imam and director of an Islamic center in England. So it's lovely to have you, both of you, here. Thank you. So please. Well, thanks, David, and thanks also to the organizers of the Common Word for having us here. Um, I know this isn't exactly the event you planned, uh, but Irma and I are enjoying our opportunity to play airy. <laughs> <laughs> I should also add that uh, though it's true that there are a lot of Mennonites who do study at the University of Manitoba, very few of them make it into the philosophy department. Uh, <laughs> work, I did my work. Um, and actually, it's interesting, I wrote my master's thesis on Mr. McIntyre. Um, so if there are, um, uh, if there's a friendship, uh, personal, academic, uh, between myself and Dr. Shamali, you can maybe blame it on this uh, irascible Irish Catholic um, whose work has influenced both of us in a variety of ways. I want to open up by reading a quote from uh, my dear friend Stanley Hauerwas um, that always comes to mind when I get asked to speak about peace, particularly in a context like this one, a Mennonite church. I know it's not just Mennonites here. Um, but Stanley opens one of his uh, essays with the following line. There are some words that certain religious traditions should never be allowed to use. Anglicans. Apologies to any Anglicans in the room, should never be allowed to say incarnation, because they usually mean by that God became human and said, say, this is not too bad. In like manner, 
Methodists should not be allowed to use the word experience because they usually mean that salvation consists in having the right feelings at the right time and in the right place. But rather than our confrontation with God being an occasion for challenging our endemic narcissism, the emphasis on experience only underwrites it. Uh, and so produces a kind of fatal narcissistic impulse. These are Stanley's words, not mine. But I think that something similar might be said uh, about Mennonites and peace. Maybe Mennonites should not be allowed to use the word peace. Uh, when Mennonites speak about peace, I find uh, it often seems to reflect uh, a preoccupation with solving problems. And sometimes it seems like Mennonites have never met a problem they didn't think they could fix uh, <laughs> by sending some sort of peace brigade uh, out into the world. So um, I, I often I teach at a Mennonite university, and we do have a, uh, a program, Peace and Conflict Transformation Studies. Uh, I teach, however, theology and philosophy. Uh, and when I contribute to that program, in some respects, I feel like all my teaching does, um, I try very hard not to use the word peace because sometimes it's just too easy. Uh, and I think we need to do a better job of, uh, of giving an account of what that means, what it looks like, uh, without using the easy word we often do um, as if we're selling products online or something to that effect. So, um, I mean, that's a little bit of a, a an introduction to, um, I mean, some people might call me a peace theologian, uh, but at the same time, I've, I, in a sense, tried to think my way into the category of peace as a kind of a split, or a torn, or a wounded category um, that calls us into question uh, as much as it does anything. Uh, and perhaps more than anything else, I think it might be helpful for us, especially in a Mennonite context, but also uh, some of the ways in which peace comes up in the context of interfaith dialogue, to think uh, and to remind ourselves that theologically speaking, that peace is not primarily a strategy, but a call. Uh, I mean, the logic of theology is not that of a pushing, of a moving forward. Um, I think progressivist impulses often make a fatal mistake, and that's to forget that we're drawn into God's presence. Uh, so I find that if we can think of peace as a name for how it is that we're drawn into the presence of God, uh, somehow that tends to, um, well, minimize the sense of self-importance I think we often feel uh, when we speak about it kind of strategically in a problem-solving manner. Um, I say all that by way of introduction. I thought I was reading a book I published uh, called A Precarious Peace, which David mentioned earlier, and uh, it was published about 10 years ago. I was reading it again recently, and I actually kind of like what I said there. Uh, <laughs> I, I mostly still agree with it, um, though it's not a book I would write again uh, if I were to write another one. Uh, so I thought instead of rehashing um, the same thing in different form, I would do a bit of a reading uh, tonight and read a couple of paragraphs uh, from this, the introduction to this book, which sets out how it is that I'm trying to think peace against itself, right? Uh, to sort of think about pacifism as a kind of wound, um, uh, which, whose woundedness is in, in many respects part of the theological point. We start here. We often think of peace or speak about peace as if it's something secured. We speak about peace as something brokered, negotiated, the end result of, in a chain of calculated instrumental causes and effects. It is imposed on the world and seeks to tame it, to bring order to a scene of war and chaos. It is, in short, a word of safety, of security, of balance. The peace of the church, by contrast, I think, is a vulnerable exchange of gifts. It is not safe, finally, but dangerous. It does not offer us a comforting mes message of security, balance, or self-confirmation, but unsettles our desire for settlement. It is not finally the effect of a cause, 
but an unwelcome interruption that perhaps again draws us out of ourselves. The peace of Christ explodes that which we take to be given. It radically transforms the world as we know it. It is paradoxically more militant, or at least more militantly disruptive, than the military. The thing about peace is, nobody says, I don't want it. I mean, peace is one of those things everyone's for. Nobody's not for peace. The only question is how we define it, what it looks like. Um, the tragedy of Christian pacifism, in some respects, is that its vision of peace has largely become captive to a sanitized discourse of humanization. It has adopted the military search for guarantees, its desire to create passages of safety. It attempts to tame and to bring order to that which is deemed wild and out of control, threatening. Like the military, Christian pacifism all too often speaks as if it has a monopoly of peace. Its rhetoric assumes that it occupies a position of ownership over peace. The pacifist speaks as if she or he inhabits a standpoint that is somehow purified of violence, of sin. Or at least he assumes that he is able to keep that violence somehow under control. But if the church is true to its call, it would speak not of such worldly peace, but of the peace of Christ, which as gift is precisely out of our control. Christian pacifism is distorted to the extent that it could be spoken of as something owned. The peace of Christ is first of all to be spoken of in confessional tones. It arises from a struggle against the background of a recognition that we are always already implicated in some form of violence or another. I'm going to repeat that. I think the most important thing uh, in speaking about peace is not that peace is somehow purified of violence. Peace that is somehow purified of violence doesn't exist in our world. The pacifist is one who struggles against the background of a recognition that we're always already implicated in some form of violence or another. It's not unlike the way we ought to think about the category of original sin, uh, if you think about it in those terms. Peace is not yet free from sin. The peace of Christ, the church's grammar of peace, is as fragile and vulnerable as it is threatening and explosive. It cannot but exist in the absence of guarantees. It moves without the benefit of strategic calculations designed to bring about results in a more effective manner. It moves without the benefit of strategic calculations designed to bring it about more effectively, and in so doing, teeters uneasily on the edge. It is, as the title of the book suggests, a precarious peace. So the theologian who is called to speak the peace of Christ will be found wandering in strange new worlds and speaking strange new words. And this is also true, perhaps especially true, with respect to the new ground we call the ordinary. In other words, one of the largely neglected tasks of the theologian is to articulate and negotiate the strangeness of that with which we are already, in some ways, all too familiar. I think the important um, violences in our world to name are not the obvious ones, not the big ones, not the exotic ones, but the subtle violences that capture our lives without our even acknowledging them. Um, so I'm interested in approaching peace in a way that attends as much to the silences that define us, to our discursive gaps, as, as I am to the explicit words and reasoned justifications we offer in favor of it. I think the Christian is one whose ear has been trained to hear the strained inflections of the so-called minority voice. She is one who has learned to become attentive to the little lies we tell ourselves every day our subtle strategies of self-legitimation. And so she is skilled at identifying the ways in which our key theological claims work against themselves, and there's nobody better at this than the great Anglican theologian Rowan Williams. The way in which a theology, in a sense, works against itself. Um, and I suppose you could say this book has been uh, influenced by Williams' work as a way of thinking about the category of peace. 
At one time, before Christians became uncomfortable with the idea of sin, before being Christian became, became confused with being happy, this sort of task was understood to be included as part of the Christian grammar of sin, as I mentioned earlier. But such a grammar has become strange and foreign, uh, as strange and foreign as the figure of the theologian itself. Nobody wants theologians anymore. Not least in those places in which the theologian is said to be at home. Let's jump toward the end of the chapter and say a few more words. Another way to say all this is to say that peace is essentially precarious. It eludes our grasp, and that's perhaps precisely the point. It surprises us. It catches us off guard. So this is to name a peace that is somehow divided against itself. It reads peace in a way that is always simultaneously for and against peace. It is thus as much a critique of a certain common conception of peace as, as it is an attempt to articulate a theologically meaningful vision of peace. Peace is often understood as a future goal that we might reach. Sometimes it's assumed to state, name a state of tranquility, of security, whether you're a utopia or a golden age. At other times, it's understood to express a sense of natural harmony or cosmic balance. In general, it's typically assumed that peace somehow articulates a stance, again, that is purified altogether of violence. But none of these assumptions adequately reflects that particular and peculiar peace that is the peace of Christ, the messianic peace. Among other things, such a peace is spoken of from a perspective that recognizes Again, that we are always already implicated in some form of violence or another. Peace, peace where there is no peace. Um, one such form of violence is the very desire to domesticate, to tame, to manage peace itself. I sometimes worry that that's what we Mennonites have done. We're better than that, of course. But sometimes it feels like we've done that. We've tamed it, we've managed it, we've brought peace out of, under control, and our task is it is to distribute it safely uh, to the world out there. And I'm trying to think against that in some ways. Far from being a world of simple comfort and confirmation, the peace of Christ is wildly disruptive. It interrupts and explodes our strategies for exercising control over things. It divests us from the schemes of classification we devise to impose and manage order. One significant implication of such a claim is that the peace of Christ cannot be located in something uh, that we simply identify as the realm of the ethical or the political. Peace isn't just an ethical category. It's not just a political uh, exercise. At least it would be misleading to suggest that it's merely ethical or political, if by that we mean that it's somehow other than theological, that it does not pertain to questions of knowledge and identity, and how it is that we undertake uh, the project of knowledge, how it is that we understand the very nature of the self, these are all bound up uh, with, with questions of peace and violence as well. So rather, the peace of Christ inaugurates a transformed way of life that informs all aspects of life. Unsettling the temptation to speak of life as a possession we must strive to have a handle on. In the most general sense, to speak of the precariousness of peace is an attempt to understand peace as a profoundly theological category. I suppose one uh, where theology goes all the way down, so to speak. And in particular, in terms of the theology of gift, I spoke about this a little bit on Friday night uh, in a different context. Such a theological piece defies the capture uh, of the establishment. We can call it that. It cannot be owned, and it's impossible to locate it decisively. Each of these all too common desires for mastery, for possession, for control, for ownership, for location, is the expression of a theological failure that somehow seeks to turn the gift of peace into a given that might somehow be secured. Um, so I'm interested in how it is that peace is a kind of an apocalyptic, um, messianic category that interrupts uh, us um, and draws us forward uh, and out of ourselves. And these are the sorts of expressions uh, of peace that I think we might want to highlight. 
Um, maybe uh, let me just close then by trying to link this up to a certain sort of temporality, uh, a way of thinking about time. Uh, I often feel like, um, if anything, we're, we're profoundly impatient people. Um, we want results and we want them now and we want to devise uh, strategies of securing certain effects more effectively. Um, but I was reading a book this morning uh, that Vince showed me the other night that reminds us uh, of, of how the uh, early uh, Christian theologians um, had a habit of writing books on patience. In fact, patience was the first virtue that was, in a sense, systematically um, explored by Christian theologians like Cyprian, Tertullian, Augustine, uh, as a, a discourse on patience as well. And patience somehow structures our way of being uh, in a way that slows down time. Irma and I have a close friend, John Swinton, who's done a lot of work um, with the disabled and reflects upon how it is that the, that the world of sort of fast-paced time, the world of violent time, if you can call it that, uh, systematically excludes the disabled, those who are sick, those who live more slowly. And perhaps uh, one of the things we need to think about is slowing down uh, in such a way that we might be claimed uh, by, by the gift of peace that God extends to us. And if I've been thinking over the last couple of days that if there's anything, um, we've often been asked how we've been impacted by experiences in interfaith dialogue. Um, and especially this one, it's the slowness uh, of the movement. Uh, not the slowness of apathy, right? It's like, okay, we don't have anything to do here, so let's just sit around and wait. Um, but the slowness of meticulous, detailed work, it's like cultivation, right? Working and reworking and letting ourselves be called out uh, of our desire to secure things for ourselves. I think I'll end it on that. Thank you. Peace be with you. In the name of God, the compassionate and merciful, I am very really grateful to God for being able to be here. And we had another meeting last night here, and it was an opportunity to visit some of you. And now I see more uh, members of this community. And as I have been uh, in relation with my friends for many, many years, so I very much feel at home. What I would like to share with you is one aspect of peace in Islam. There are many different aspects, and with uh, Professor Ali Hubner, we both have a course uh, this summer in CISO in CNB, at CNBO about peace resources in Islam and Christianity. And that was a very good experience of both of us working together and teaching this course. So I just try to mention one aspect which I think by itself can show how deeply peace is uh, rooted in Islamic way of thinking. As you know, we greet each other by saying salam, salam alaikum, or alaikum salam, uh, which means peace be with you. Uh, as we have also shalom in the Hebrew language. So what I want to share with you is verses of the Quran about these greetings of peace and then when I, if I get a chance I will talk about uh, the way God himself is introduced as peace and the way by returning to God we can gain peace. So first, as a way of greeting we find in the Quran that the prophets used to greet 
people by offering peace. For example, we find about Abraham that in response to the greetings of the angels, we will talk about them later, offered the greeting of peace. We find interestingly about Jesus that as soon as Jesus was born, when he was a newborn baby, and start talking to people. You know the story. So in chapter 19, which is chapter named after Lady Mary, we have few sentences said by Jesus in that time. And if you read from verses 30 to 33, you see that Jesus introduces himself and says that God has enjoined me to pray, to give alms as long as I am alive, to be kind to my mother. And then Jesus says, Wassalamu alayya yawma ulittu wa yawma amutu wa yawma ubaatu hayya. Peace be with me. Normally we say peace be with you. But it says peace be with me the day I was born, the day I die, and the day I will be resurrected. Which confirms that it is not only a formal greeting, it's actually a kind of prayer. When I say peace be with you, means I am praying to God to grant you peace. And in the same way you can pray to God to grant yourself peace. So I can also send greetings of peace to myself. So we have verses in the Quran about prophets greet people or angels with these greetings. We also have in the Quran that people of heaven, inhabitants of heaven, also greet each other with peace. For example, in chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, God talks about the believers who do righteous deeds, how they are in heaven. And then God says, fiha subhanaka Allahumma. They glorify God while they praise Him. Watahiyatuhum fiha salam. Those who are in heaven, they greet each other with peace. It shows how important is peace, that even in heaven, which is the place of peace, as we will say later, still they ask for more peace for each other. Also in chapter 14, verse 23, God says, God says the people who have faith and do righteous deeds will be led to enter gardens beneath which rivers flow. They will be there permanently and their greetings is peace. Then we have about the greetings of the angels. And I have classified it in this way. Angels greet in this world by offering peace. At the time of death, at the time of entering heaven and inside heaven. In all these cases we have in the Quran verses that confirm that they greet with offering peace. For example, in this world, in chapter 15, verses 51 to 53, God says, وَنَبِّقْهُمْ عَنْ ضَيْفَ Ibrahim," And inform them about the guest of Abraham. You know, the angels who went to visit Abraham. And when they entered, فَقَالُوا salam." They said, peace be with you. And Abraham was worried because they didn't first know who are these people and why are they there. 
قَالَ إِنَّا مِنْكُمْ وَجِلُونَ He said, we are, you know, somehow worried, fearful. قَالُوا لَا تَوْجَ They said, no, don't worry. And we are giving you the good news of having a son. So, these angels offered greetings of peace to Abraham and then after that gave him the good news of having a son. Or in another place, in chapter 11, verse 69, God says that the angels visited Abraham with the good news and they said, Salam, qala salam. They said, peace be with you. And he said the same. Of course, there's a little difference between the way they greeted and the way Abraham replied, which means uh, to discuss you know, some points about rhetorics. I leave it for uh, another. <coughs> Basically, try to greet better because in Islam we say whenever you are greeted, you have to greet either the same or better. So he tried to do it in a better way. At the time of death, Chapter 16, verse 32. God says, الَّذِينَ تَتَبَفَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ طَيِّبِينَ يَقُولُونَ السَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ اُدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Those whose souls angels receive at the time of death while they are pure. So in a pure condition, their soul is received. Angels will tell them, سَلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ Peace be with you. Enter heaven because of what you have been doing. At the time of entrance to heaven, chapter 39, verse 73. God says that the pious people are led towards heaven. And when they reach heaven, the doors are opened. And the keepers of heaven, the angels who are responsible, would say, peace be with you. You have been living piously and enter heaven while you be there forever. And inside heaven, also inside heaven, they again greet them with peace. In the verse, verses 23 and 24 of chapter 13, God says, Jannatu Adnan yadkhulunaha wa man sadaha min abadihim wa azwatihim wa dhurriyatihim. Those who are pious, they enter heaven and whoever is qualified who has you know some affinity from parents the spouse children they will also join them and angels angels visit them in their homes from every gate they visit them and say peace be with you because of your patience. In this world, in dunya, you were patient. Now this is the result. You talked about patience. So, we have angel, greetings of the prophets, greetings of angels. We have the greetings of God himself. In the Quran, we find that God himself also offers the greetings of peace. So, for example, chapter 19, the same chapter, Lady Mary, verse 15, it's about John the Baptist, Prophet Yahya. Very similar to the way Jesus greeted himself, but God greets John the Baptist. Peace be with him the day he was born, the day he dies, and the day he would be resurrected alive. God offers the greetings of peace to Noah, to Abraham, to Moses, Aaron, 
and in general to all messengers. In chapter 37, there are verses that mention all these things. And also inside heaven. And I think that would be perhaps one of the most joyful things in heaven. I hope, inshallah, we evolve and we experience this. So, the people who are inside heaven, they would receive the greetings of peace from the merciful Lord. Salamun qawla min rabbin rahim. They would receive a word of peace from the merciful Lord. This is in chapter 36, verse 58. Then, what we find the Quran in addition to these statements, which tells us how prophets greeted, how angels greet, how God greets, then we have instructions that God says you should offer this greeting of peace. For example, in the story of Moses and Aaron, when God asked them to go to Pharaoh, God told them, you should speak to Pharaoh in a soft language. This is in chapter 20. But it is interesting that after a few verses, the Quran said that actually God also told them what to say. So he said, I speak in a soft manner, but also gave the content to Moses and Aaron. Fa'atiyahu. And there's a beautiful point here. When one of my teachers said, and uh, I think I should say, uh, this is a good uh, news for those who work for peace and for dialogue. Earlier in this chapter, chapter 20, God says to Moses, go to Pharaoh, Ezra, go. And when he asked for a few things, one of them is to have a helper, which is a brother of Aaron. God says, after that, you, both of you, you two go. But here, in verse 47, God says, Fa'atiyahu, come to Pharaoh. So earlier said go, and now says come. My teacher said something very beautiful. I had not noticed before. So it means that I am not just sending you there. I am also there waiting for you to come. So I'm not going to leave you alone. So whoever works for peace, it's not that God says, you know, this is your mission, go and, you know, report to me. He is there and waiting for you. Also, we have another verse which says, إِنَّنِي مَعَكُمَا أَسْمَعُ وَعَرَى I will be with you, hearing and watching you. So God is not sending us for a mission alone. Prophet Muhammad was also asked to invoke peace upon the believers. For example, God says, وَإِذَا جَاءَكَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِآيَاتِنَا فَقُلْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْهِ When those who believe in our communications come to you, you tell them, peace be with you. It's very interesting that the Prophet had the manner of always be the first person to offer peace. No one was able to precede the Prophet. There is a story that one young man once said, you know, I do something to precede the Prophet. I want to offer peace to the Prophet before he offers peace to me. So he went behind the wall in the corner and tried to hide himself. And the plan was, when the Prophet comes, he jumps and says, Salaamu Alaikum. But when he jumped, he was not able to speak. And the Prophet said, peace be with you. And then he was relaxed and then he was able just to reply. <laughs> so, the Prophet was, although you know, we are normally saying, the youngest should uh, try to say greetings of peace to the elders, you know, to the students, to the teachers. We shouldn't wait for the elders to say like, the peace. 
But the Prophet was always the first person to say peace to other people. And of course, I think part of the reason is that no one is able to offer peace to the Prophet. He is the one who is closer to God and he offers peace to the Prophet. To people. The Quran tells us that not only the Prophet was supposed to say greetings of peace to the believers, but even to the people that rejected the message. It's very interesting. Chapter 43, verses 87 to 89. There is a conversation between God and the Prophet that these people who deny God, you know, you know not totally, but you know, the idol worshippers, they used to have idols, but deep in their mind, they knew that these idols are not creators. So the Quran says, if you ask them who created them, they will say God. They will not say these idols, although they were worshipping idols. But if you could surprise them by this question, they would go back to their innate knowledge of God. In any way, then God said that those people who do not believe, leave them. And tell them peace be with you. In future they will understand what was the truth. No need to fight, no need you know, even to quarrel or you know to keep arguing. When you make your point, they listen, they ask, you can answer, but it reaches the point that there is no benefit. Just say, Salam, peace be with you. We don't want to fight, we don't want to get into any uh, war. Also in chapter 25, verse 63, God praises the people who are, a speak, who are walking on the earth with humbleness, when those who are arrogant, sorry, ignorant, those who are impolite, address them, say bad words to them. They say, peace be with you. Even they don't say, you know, what you say, for example, is for yourself, you know, you, know, you are worse than what you say. No, nothing. Just, they say, may God give you peace. That's it. Then we find the Quran that the best time and the best place is also characterized as being peace. You know, uh, if you are familiar with Muslim calendar, uh, we have in the months of Ramadan, which is the holy month for us, we have one night which we call Laylatul Qadr the night of measure or the night of might or power. And this night is very important because this is the night in which the Quran was revealed and this is the night in which we believe our affairs for the next 12 months will be decided by God. Therefore Muslims try not to sleep and be involved in praying, asking forgiveness and this type of things. So this night which is according to the Quran, chapter 97, better than 1,000 months. It's a very special night. But one of the characteristics of this night is Salam here. This night is a night of peace. So, the most precious night, God describes it as a night of peace. The best place is heaven. Again, the Quran, you find that God describes heaven as the abode of peace. Chapter 6, verses 126 and 127. Lahum darus salam. Darus means the abode of peace. So when Muslims went to East Africa in Tanzania, they called it Darussalam. But Darussalam is initially 
a Quranic description of heaven, which means the abode of peace. So, the best night, the best place, but more than anything else, Salam is one of the names of God. In chapter 59, verse 23, salam. And then it continues. One of the names of God is Salam. Peace is the name of God. And it is not anything else. It's not, for example, grantor of peace. We have moment which means grantor of security, but Salam is peace. Absolute peace is God. And then we have about the Quran, which is, I think, very, very important for all Muslim ethicists, jurists, politicians to work on this verse. Chapter 5, verse 16. God says about the Quran, Yahdi bihillahu man ittada'aridwanahu subun as-salam. With the Quran, those who seek the pleasure of God will be guided to the ways of peace. So the Quran gives us ways of peace. Means how to get peace into your marital relation, into parental relation, in your work, in your study, in your neighborhood. In everything you need peace, the scripture guides you. So, the Quran is the book that shows us the ways of peace and how sad it is that a book which is the book of peace from God of peace, who always talks about peace in this world, hereafter, prophets, angels, all, if someone interprets the Quran in the way that endorses war and makes it manual for fighting. This is very sad, very... Uh, I don't think uh, our non-Muslim brothers and sisters can understand how much we Muslims feel sad when someone, you know, hijacks our religion or our book, which is the book of peace, and tries to endorse war and fight. And the Quran also tells us that we human beings, at the same time that we should work for having external peace, but we should not forget the significance of internal peace. And both external and internal peace, but especially internal peace, can be secured by returning to God. I am not saying that those who don't believe in God cannot have external peace. They can have external peace. But maybe it would not be very durable. If we all were following the will of God and trying to resemble God and have godly behavior, we would have endurable peace in this world, but more than anything else in our spirit and the hereafter. So it's by remembrance of God that we can come to serenity and tranquility. So, I just thought maybe this can give you a flavor of what the Quran tells us about peace. And when we have such a rich culture of peace, anything else has to be understood in the way which is compatible with this. No one can change the reality of the message of the Quran to justify being harsh, being, you know, a warrior, or, you know, someone who always looks for opportunity to initiate war. Uh, I hope God Almighty helps us to work together to not only establish peace between ourselves, which I think is too little. You know, sometimes people say, 
we Muslims, Christians, should you know, have dialogue so that we have peace. I think it's actually insult. You know, we are not wolves that you know should learn how to live together. We are brothers and sisters, and our aim of dialogue is not that to fight. Our aim of dialogue is how to offer other people beauty of faith, how we can together give joint testimony of beauty of faith. We have great responsibility for the rest of humanity and for the whole creation. Otherwise, we are brothers and sisters. And for brothers and sisters, there is no, you know, nothing more natural than being together, talking to each other, working together, visiting each other. Not brothers and sisters should speak to each other because they don't want to fight. It's too little. So, we Muslims and Christians, I believe, have to appreciate lots of similarities that we have, how God has made us brothers and sisters, and work together to offer this peace. And I am, in, I am very grateful to God for all His blessing, and in particular I would like to mention the great friends that I have been given by God in my Christian friends. And one of the things that I always try is to learn from positive things that, and you know, beautiful things that everyone has. If God has given any person, any community something beautiful, I also thank God and try to appreciate. In our discussion, which is now almost 16, 17 years that I am involved from 2001, I'm involved in Mennonite Shia dialogue. I've been very impressed by our Mennonites' emphasis on peace. Not that we have agreed on everything, because for us, absolute peace, you know, sometimes think we have to have self-defense, whatever, we always try to understand better. But I think the testimony that you give about peace is very important. You know, sometimes we need someone to be, you know, more bold so that we get the message. Maybe we don't agree 100%, but I think your interest and your theology of peace is very important. And one of the things that we did was, when we were planning our curriculum for our institute in Co, for the uh, most advanced level, I suggested that it was agreed we put a unit on peace studies. So we talk Islamic about Islamic understanding of peace and Christian understanding of peace. And many times we invited Christian friends to teach, like Harry has been teaching, or we have sent them to CMU, EMU, to get the Christian side from our Mennonite friends. So I am very happy that through our relation I have learned many things but in particular about the significance of peace, which very much resonates with the way I think the Quran is speaking about the significance of peace. Thank you very much. So may I invite uh, you who would like to uh, open up a little avenue of discussion? to come to the microphone and do that. And if you don't, I will dominate. <laughs> I will be terrible. A Muslim speaker uh, referred to the fact that it made him sad to see people interpreting the Quran in a way that justified war. I believe that is equally common in Christianity, and I wonder if our Mennonite uh, speaker uh, would address that, because I think it applies also to us Mennonites in, a, in a, at least an indirect way, in that it is my impression that many of our members are very happy to support an evangelical preacher uh, of a non Mennonite persuasion who is strongly in favor of the war. Could you comment on that? Well, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, 
there's all kinds of ways in, in which um, even in someone like Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, relish pointing this out all the time, even which uh, sort of kind of Mennonite commitment to peace in a variety of ways complicit. Uh, I don't think Niebuhr's uh, solution is ultimately one in which I'm in favor, uh, but I think we often focus on you know, certain categories of violence and peace in such a way that we blind ourselves to others. Um, and if that's what you're talking about, there's no question that that is going on all the time, um, and it's worth paying very good attention to. Could I follow up on that just a little bit? I was wondering if, if both of you could just say a little bit, I know this is a very large question, but if you could say just a little bit about what the spiritual pathway is to coming to the place of peace. It's one thing to hold it out there as a kind of abstract idea, but what does, what does the Shia tradition teach us? Just a little hint of this about the pathway to coming to that place which is in God. This is a very good question. I think, first of all, the main thing is we should achieve I'm not saying this is a condition, you know, that we don't do anything unless we achieve this, but I think the main success comes when people inside themselves gain peace. When I know myself and I treasure the gift of dignity and honor that God has given me and every human being, and the potentials that I have to become a godly person, if I appreciate that, then I will not be harming people, I will not be showing lack of regard to other people. I will treat everyone as a child of God, as a creature of God, as a sign of God, as a manifestation of God. Our hadith tell us that when people don't have self-honor, then you have to be worried. Because when someone internally feels, you know, weak and empty, then that's worrying. So we need to, this is where prayer becomes important, spirituality becomes important, humbleness becomes important. But then there are techniques that we have to use to bring this internal peace outside. And one of the, I think, important things is knowing each other. If we don't know each other, first, we become suspicious. You know, if you have a, for example, you know, a place, for example, in your local neighborhood, you see people go, come, and you don't know what they do, you see, in a few hours they are there, then they come, you know, they are, you know, strange people. This being a strange little by little makes you suspicious. Who are these people going, coming, you know, taking something, bringing, you know, something? And then, little by little, this can lead to hostility. Our first Imam says, Annas a'da uma People become hostile towards what they don't know. So we have to invest on knowledge, education, especially first-hand experience and knowledge. So if I have never met Muslims or I have never met Christians and I have only read about them in the books, if I am lucky, and if I'm not lucky, I have only watched them on TV, then it's totally different thing. It would not help me. So when we have 
experiences of living together, talking to each other, eating. I very much think, you know, we should have personal experiences. Eating, traveling together, doing projects together. Then you would see we are all human beings. We can have good Muslims, bad Muslims, good Christians, bad Christians. This has not that much anything to do with our religion or faith. It's mostly our personal problems. Instead of we benefiting from our faith, we bring our problems to our faith. And that's the problem. Many Muslim leaders, or maybe I don't want to speak about other communities, but I think it's common. It's not that they do these things because they are Muslim. If they were not Muslim, they would have done these things. It's not a matter of Muslim, Christian, Jew. It's a matter of personality of people. But you know, we hide ourselves behind these, you know, sacred names. So I think we need to create opportunities, especially for youngsters, young clerics, young activists, to meet each other, work together, leaders. So this is why you know, we invest on education, on you know, exchange program, inviting, sending, doing projects together. And I think there is no other alternative. This is the best way of, I think, peacemaking. That you make people meet each other, talk to each other, and feel comfortable. Many of our problems, I think, disappear when we start uh, talking and, you know, living together. And if we stop meeting and talking, even husband and wife who have long experience together and have children, if they stop talking to each other, after some time, they separate. If two brothers never talk to each other, they will separate. So we have to have this, I think, relation, but we don't forget that internal also spiritual. A word on this. <laughs> no, just one. Um, one of the things that I thought was very striking about uh, Dr. Shamali's very helpful uh, account of uh, peace in the Muslim tradition is the way in which you, I think you notice how it's it's not a goal that we're working toward, but a structuring of our, our way of being, right? Um, postures of humility, uh, submission, how we relate to one another, to God, to self. Uh, I think we, uh, and this is of course where spiritual disciplines come in. Um, so peace, I think, uh, ought to be understood as that uh, condition um, of what we Mennonites like to talk about in terms of discipline, discipleship, right? So all the ecclesial um, practices that, that we perform, sometimes fail to perform, uh, I mean, these are in ways in which we structure uh, ourselves spiritually as the body of Christ. And, and I think um, we, we sometimes separate those, right? Church is where we come to worship, uh, and then peace is the, the stuff we do once we've been properly inspired. I'm struck by how on the night of power, in fact in the whole of Ramadan, the whole issue of fasting, of letting go of your imagined needs, the whole issue of prayer, entering deeper into a sense of regard, and then on the night of power, the act of forgiveness, the act of confession and forgiveness, which opens up a space. So it's possible to not respond with enmity, but to actually see the face of another human being. Is there someone else who would like to come to the microphone? I was, thank you, thank you very much um, for both, what you said both, and, and I was very impressed by what you just um, said, David, or what you repeated, David, and what you, Dr. Shomani, said about the, this, um, um, there's two opposites uh, in the light of power, fasting for peace, so these words power and peace, and how to live peace, Powerless, though it's power, was very striking for me. 
and I was wondering, Dr. Rübner, is, um, is this the piece you, you talked about? Uh, in, in when you um, read out of your book, was this the piece you mentioned? Not a piece, uh, a piece that is approachable or doable or manageable, or a piece that is there because you avoid mechanisms and structures of power. I try to I try to understand what you what you said, and I was wondering when I listened to Dr. Shomali if this is the piece you meant, which is surprisingly there because you uh, you be still and avoid. Everything besides, yeah, thinking, I don't know. Um, oh, I'd like to say yes, but I'd like that yes not to be understood uh, as the yes of, see, it's exactly the same. Um, Mennonites and Muslims aren't exactly the same. Sorry? No, no, sorry. sorry. Um, but I think what I heard Dr. Shamali doing was structuring in a more positive way the kinds of things that I was, um, in a sense, giving a more critical account of. So the two accounts, uh, I think, work very compatibly together. I mean, what does it look like? I think one of the things that peace looks like, if we talk about it this way, is something like the large communities, right? Um, which is simply presence, okay? communities uh, of, of, of being together uh, with, with the mentally handicapped, mentally disabled, uh, and, and being in community together, being present for one another. It's not a program and a big goal, um, but a simple love uh, of the other um, in whose face we are in awe because we see God. I think that's my, my different way of saying something very close to what Dr. Shamali was giving the camera. I also would like to say thank you very much for presentations that we've heard. Uh, at the risk of uh, inserting either devil's advocate or uh, negativity into a supposed agreement here, I have, uh, I'd like to make an observation. I think there is more of an eschatological uh, reference of the peace of God, which I heard from Dr. Shimali, and what the Quran is saying. And then, of course, he pointed out the big irony of the warfaring, which uh, we understand uh, seems to be coming out of the East and the Muslim communities and that kind of thing, which he lamented and we all agreed with. But the uh, end of life aspect is also that which has caused Christianity to be such a terrible warfaring, warmongering presence in this world. Because many, many Christians believe this peace is unattainable, you know being nice to our neighbors and being understanding of disabled people and kind and all those things. Therefore, we'll get that when we go to heaven. In the meantime, let's build up our armaments, let's go to war, make sure this country is a Christian country and keep the others out of there. So the S that heaven peace uh, can be something that works against peace. Uh, I'm saying that uh, yet very appreciative of what Dr. Shivali said, but an observation. I think us Christians have, uh, and, and, and I would agree though with Chris that us Mennonites historically have a bit of an unfair advantage these days 
Uh, many think, you know, our friends, our Lutherans, our Catholic, our Methodist friends, Mennonites, they are the ones whom we should listen to a little more. But we know that uh, the essence of peace uh, evades us a lot also. Especially in our interpersonal relationships. <laughs> I'm going to answer that one by talking about Dante, um, who interestingly, I should probably not say this, but I will, um, in the eighth circle of hell, you know, the, the main structure of the divine comedy, right? Dante gets, loses himself in the dark wood, he's entirely alone. Um, God, through Beatrice, sends Virgil. Um, to save Dante from himself. Virgil takes him down um, through the Inferno. Come back to this. The eighth circle of the Inferno, Dante locates Muhammad. Um, but also, there's no Mennonites there. <laughs> but what you, but uh, there would be, because the other figure uh, in the eighth circle is basically a proto-Anabaptist reformer. Um, and for Dante, this is a reference to the kind of schismatic um, temptation that he finds in both of these things. Now, we also need to remember that Dante's locations aren't final. Um, these are as much postures of lament uh, as anything. So, in, in a sense, he's sort of trying to jar the imagination of his readers. I find it interesting that Mennonites and Muslims uh, are at least seen by Dante as partners uh, in a, in a uh, ironic sort of way. Irony maybe isn't the right word. Dante, of course, uh, has one of the richest eschatological imaginations uh, in, in the history of Western literature. Um, and he might not be thought of as a very peaceable figure. Um, but what's important about Dante's uh, vision in the comedy is that uh, it opens by him thinking he can go straight up the mountain, okay, by himself, using uh, basically kind of intellectual, making an intellectual ascent using kind of pure philosophy, pure intellect um, to, the, to the exclusion of the will or the body. And of course it doesn't work that way. His attempt to go straight up gets blocked. He meets Virgil, Virgil takes him down. Virgil doesn't take him on a straight path but a path of conversion, okay? The way to paradise, which is, uh, of course, in Dante's cosmos, uh, the spinning of the planets circling Earth, he wasn't, uh, he was before Copernicus, is only possible because we are constantly turning and turning around, okay? The way of conversion is the way to paradise, which gives us a very different sort of eschatological frame than anything that could legitimate the kind of self-securing uh, moves that you were talking about. So I think in a really interesting way, Dante, though he puts Muhammad and Mennonites not quite in hell, uh, confirms the vision that this uh, Muslim and this Mennonite were giving expression to today. <laughs> I think, as I mentioned, uh, the Quran tells us that peace is nothing uh, which is only for the hereafter. It's a whole culture and atmosphere of peace in which we have to grow. And especially the verse which says that the Quran guides towards the ways of peace. Salam. Guidance is for this world, guidance is not for the hereafter. So we have to learn from the scripture how to reach peace in all our relations. Relation with ourselves, with people, with environment, with God, with truth. In every relation we have to reach peace. I don't think there is any way to emphasize on peace more than this. In all relations that human beings get involved, 
they should reach peace. And that's also it's interesting from a linguistic point of view. You know, we have uh, normally two terms for peace. One is sulh, one is salam, <coughs> peace. Then, sulh is used against harm, for example, war. But literally, sol, which is for peace, is opposite to fasad, salah and fasad. You know, in good condition or corruption. So this shows that war is corruption. War is illness. Health, good order, good condition is peace. And I don't think any religion can tell people go and get ill or make other people ill. Anyone who has such understanding of religion has not understood the whole point of having religion. People get ill by themselves. They need treatment. They need healing. Another thing that we find about the Quran is that God says, "Nunazzilu min al-Quran ma wa shifaun wa rahma." We send down from the Quran healing and mercy. Why some people understand the Quran in the way that instead of giving healing and mercy, <laughs> is causing illness, war, tension, and no mercy? Again, as you said about Christianity, this has also happened. Anything sacred, anything in which there is value and power and you know energy can be hijacked and misused. But true believers, I think, they know that this is this has nothing to do with you know religion. One of the uh Central things that a Christian say, we said it this morning, of course, is Kiri Eleison, Lord have mercy. And that word, Eleison, in Greek, is the word for the olive tree. So what we are saying is, anoint us with healing oil. Heal our wounds so we can be whole. Just one final comment, please. We're going to, we're going to have to. I'm sorry, it Jack. Is just a Please, but you're on. You're on. Question, and, and I'm addressing it to both of you. Um, could you speak about your faith in the context of peace without justice? I think justice is an important factor in peace, without which, yeah, it's pretty hard to get there. Justice is a very central value and Muslim ethicists say that it is a value that has no exception. So for example, if sometimes generosity can be harmful. Yeah, imagine for example you are a generous person and making a person lazy. Then say, okay, here generosity is not good in this case. Or you are kind, but you see, your kindness can be a spoiling your children. Anyway, there are kind of exceptions. But justice has no exception. There is no case that we say injustice is good. So justice is a very essential, central value. And Justice and peace are very closely connected to each other because there can be no violation of you know rights of people and doing injustice unless creates a wound and this damages peace. Yeah? So injustice is the main problem of having no peace plus ignorance. There are Two sources that the Quran tells us are sources of major source of our problems. Because the Quran says God trust gave his trust to humanity. 
the trust that mountains and the sky and the earth said we cannot carry. But humanity undertook the trust of God. But Unfortunately, the practice humanity showed injustice and ignorance. So sometimes people are doing injustice willingly or sometimes out of ignorance. So if we want to have peace, we should try to avoid injustice. Again, this is two things. Education, to make people sensitive about the rights of each other or other people. And secondly, to establish righteousness. Because in Islamic understanding, justice starts from within and then it's without. So I can live in alone in a cave and be unjust. Because in Islam, you have the concept of doing injustice to yourself also. Actually, I cannot do injustice to other people without first doing injustice to myself. So we have internal justice, external, like peace, internal peace. So basically what I want to say is, all the problems go back to lacking two things. Understanding and purity. If we don't have purity, or we don't have understanding, so we have to invest on education and moral development, spirituality. These are the, I think, two major solutions. That's a great question. I'll try to come at it in, from a different way. Um, I think it's very hard, uh, particularly in a North American Christian context, to um, to navigate this one. Uh, I mean, it's, there's no question that, that, that there's no justice without peace and vice versa. But we've come to think of these two categories as functioning very differently. I made mention to the, of the work of Reinhold Niebuhr before. And this is, in many respects, one that still grips the Mennonite imagination. We think of, uh, in Niebuhr's case, peace as something that's merely interpersonal. Um, it's something that you and I can work at, but justice is social. Uh, we split the personal and the social apart from one another, uh, think that justice is, is exists in, in one of those worlds and peace in the other, and I think that just massively messes things up. Uh, I think we also tend to think of justice merely in terms of fairness, okay, as John Rawls famously puts it, sort of somehow um, uh, managing uh, or at least resisting inequality. Um, but justice is of course a virtue uh, which structures our relations both personally and socially. Uh, peace is not a virtue so much as the, uh, the telos, the goal uh, into which we are drawn. Um, and if we think about it that way, I think then a very different way of understanding the relationship might occur. Would you join me in thanking our colleagues? Thank you. 
for your participation and collaboration. Thank you. I think that's all by way of thank yous. Um, I would like to direct your attention to two pieces that are on the center of your tables. The first one being a brochure on Mennonite Church, Alberta. And for your convenience, it's been folded over to the North Edmonton Ministry. The North Edmonton Ministry is one part of the uh, Ministry of Mennonite Church, Alberta. So there's a very brief uh, rundown of what Donna and her ministry does, with the support of her husband, uh, Laura, who is here tonight, too. I, I think we need to be careful. We never forget Laura. <laughs> A very brief thumbnail sketch of what that ministry is. But you also have a colored card on your table as well, which is a, a list of things in which you can participate in this ministry. I'd like to join the prayer team by email. I'd like to receive monthly updates. I'd like to have Donna visit my church or community group. I'd like to participate in a multicultural meal. I'd like to join a multi faith book club. Or I can visit so many dollars one time, monthly, or yearly to this ministry. Or I would like to help by any other uh, means that you feel you'd like to help. Uh, this ministry is supported by Mennonite Church Alberta, as you've already heard. Uh, but uh, it is also a ministry not fully funded by Mennonite Church Alberta. It's the contributions of organizations like Mennonite Central Committee and other individuals and so we are in need of this ministry. I think uh, there's a shortfall of about fifteen thousand dollars, which you know is, seems big, but it's you know it's it's really quite easy to erase. I think. So anyway, um, just a little bit of background in terms of uh, what we're needing for the ongoing support of this ministry. I think it's been going seven years now, isn't it? About that, yeah. So uh, I think the fact that it's made it this far is is a, is an accomplishment in itself. So thank you all for being here and for your consideration of how you might contribute uh, to this ministry. So this brings uh, to close the formal part of our meeting tonight. We were hoping to be done by close to nine. I think we could make it, but uh, um, I, we don't want to hurry you. Uh, take your time to read over the information you have, uh, help yourself to the, the goodies that are in front of you, and, um, and then uh, when you feel like you'd like to go, simply Head your way. It is a work day tomorrow. Uh, so I'd like to say uh, thanks for being here and may you all go in peace, the peace of God. Thank you.